Among the various transformations of Brownian motion that we can see are also Brownian motions, just from the fact that it's a Gaussian process with the specified covariance S min T, was the following fact. Given any fixed positive time, capital T, if we define the new process S little t to be B capital T plus little t minus B capital T, for any Brownian motion B, this process S is also a Brownian motion, and in fact is independent of the process B up to time capital T. Well, it turns out that the same statement remains true even if T is not a fixed time but is an optional time with respect to the Brownian filtration. That's our main result for right now. Let tau be any optional time with respect to the original Brownian filtration. Let nu be any probability measure on the state space that we'll use as our initial distribution, for which there is a positive probability that that optional time is finite. Otherwise, the statement we're about to make will still be kind of true, but also kind of trivial. Then define a new process S to be B shifted by tau, and then B tau subtracted off. This, of course, only makes sense on the event that tau is less than infinity, and so we could just define the process S to be zero on the event that tau is infinity if we want, or we can restrict our universe to the event that tau is finite. Then, conditioned on this event, S is also a Brownian motion, and it is independent from the stopped sigma field Ft plus even. Again, just to be as precise as possible, all of the filtrations we're working with here are the natural filtrations for the process B. Let's be very precise about what this means. What we're saying is that for any appropriate function that is a bounded measurable function on path space, measurable with respect to the cylinder sigma field, if I take the conditional expectation of F of the process S, given that tau is finite, that's the same thing as the expected value of f of the original Brownian motion started at time zero. That's the statement that this is a Brownian motion. It has the same law on path space as the Brownian motion conditioned on this event. Moreover, for any event a in the stopped sigma field f tau plus, if I take the conditional expectation of any such function of the process s times the indicator of a, given that tau is finite, that's the product of the conditional expectation of just f at s times the conditional expectation of just the indicator of a, which is the same as the probability of a conditioned on tau being finite. That is the independence statement right here. We're going to very carefully prove this statement using the strong Markov property. First, we're going to abuse notation slightly. Remember that Markov shift operator theta t, which was defined to be a function on the path space, just shifting paths forward by t. What we'd like to do is shift paths forward by tau. But of course, that doesn't make sense as a function on path space. So instead, we're going to think of it as a function on the process. We'll say that x tau plus is denoted as the process x composed with theta tau. This composition now is taking place in the time variable. That notation is handy because then our process st, which is defined to be b t plus tau minus b tau, can be written like this. It's b composed with theta tau at t minus b composed with theta tau at zero. But you can check that these compositions, as usual, commute with the actions on the range of the function, like adding. And so we could write this instead as the process b minus b0 composed with theta tau at time t. Now that's significant and really is fundamentally why this result is going to be true, because no matter which initial distribution we use for the Markov process b, b minus b0 starts at zero at time zero. Now let's compute the terms that we need for this theorem. We'll compute the conditional expectation in starting distribution nu of our function of the process s on the event that tau is finite, conditioned on f tau plus. This is set up nicely to use the strong Markov property. 
from our observation over here, this is the same as f at b minus b0 composed with theta t, so conditioned, and also we can take this indicator function outside because since tau is an optional time, tau is f tau plus measurable. Now the strong Markov property tells us exactly that this is the same as just the expectation, starting in some arbitrary state x, of f of the process b minus b0 at x equals b minus b0 evaluated at tau. Of course, the strong Markov property holds for this process b minus b0 because that's just a Brownian motion conditioned to start at 0. But here's the deal. Let's remember exactly what this means. We have this process here, and we're taking the expected value of this random variable given x as our starting distribution for the Markov process. That gives us a measurable function of x. And then we're taking that function of x and evaluating it at some random variable. But the thing is, the function that maps x to this expected value is constant. Because no matter what x is, b minus b0 evaluated at 0 is 0, px almost surely. So that says that this evaluation has no meaning for us, and in fact this function is just the constant, which is of course the expected value starting at 0 of f at b. That fundamentally is why this result is true. So let's now put the pieces together to get the exact statement that we wanted. What we wanted was to look at items like this. We wanted to see that this factors appropriately. Well, to start, let's just write down the definition. The conditional expectation of this random variable given this event is the reciprocal of the probability of this event, which we assumed was non-zero, times the expected value of this random variable times the indicator of that event. Well, the first thing we're going to do is employ the tower property and write this expectation here as the expectation of the conditional expectation of the stuff inside. Given f tau plus. Now we use the result that we just proved above. And we can write that instead inside as the expectation starting in state 0 of f at b but this expectation here is not a random variable that's just a constant so we can pull it outside and so putting that together with taking the reciprocal again what we get is that this is exactly equal to that constant times what's left over is the conditional expectation of the indicator of a given that tau is finite. So that's pretty close to what we wanted to prove. To get all the way there, we take that statement that we just proved and apply it with the event a being the full probability space. That will tell us that the conditional expectation of just f at s given that tau is finite is the expectation of f at b and state 0 at time 0 times 1. And that, by the way, was the first statement that we wanted to show. What that tells us exactly is that conditioned on this event, s is a Brownian motion starting at 0. And now we will take the result that we proved and rewrite it. And so that tells us that the conditional expectation of f at s times the indicator of a given that tau is finite is equal to the conditional expectation of f at s given that tau is finite times the conditional expectation of the indicator of a given that tau is finite. And that's the independent statement which concludes our proof. So b tau plus t minus b tau 
is still a Brownian motion for any optional time tau conditioned on that tau being finite. And that Brownian motion is independent from f tau plus. Now again, we showed using Gaussian process methods back in lecture 55.2 that when tau is a fixed time capital T, we get that result, except that we only showed in that case that that new Brownian motion was independent of f t. Here we get the stronger statement that it's independent of f t plus. Let's also note something that we find out from this, which is that since tau is an optional time, it is f tau plus measurable, which means that this process st here is actually independent from tau, conditioned on the event that tau is finite. And that is going to allow us to stitch together Brownian motions, stopping at time tau and continuing with a different Brownian motion afterward, which yields the celebrated reflection principle for Brownian motion. If B is a Brownian motion on RD, and tau is an optional time adapted to its natural filtration, then the following process is also a Brownian motion. Now this looks a little complicated here. We're taking the stopped process at time tau, and then subtracting from it this object here, which is related to the kind of Brownian motion we just added. But let's just see what exactly this means. Here, when t is less than time tau, this term is zero, and we're just proceeding with a normal Brownian motion. Then we reach time tau, and at that point, what we're doing here is we're reflecting the path. Whatever the path was before with bt, we're just taking its reflection across the horizontal line at whatever height b tau is. In this picture, we've taken tau to be the hitting time of some height z. This is itself another demonstration of how rough Brownian paths are in a meta kind of way. They're so rough that at any height, I can take the whole path afterward and flip it upside down, and it looks exactly the same as it did before. Now that's not to say that it's actually the same path that it was before. It's to say that the measure on paths, the Wiener measure, is invariant under those transformations. So Brownian paths writ large are so rough that doing that transformation produces a new path which looks no different than the old one. Of course, if you did that to a smooth path, you would introduce a kink almost always, and you'd be able to recognize it as different than it was before. We can prove this relatively quickly using the results that we just showed. First, it suffices to show that this new process, which I'm calling b tilde t, is a Brownian motion on any compact time interval. So we'll go ahead and restrict to that compact time interval when appropriate. And actually, the only reason we're going to do that is to note that, therefore, we can replace our optional time tau with tau min t. And tau min t is certainly finite. It's always less than or equal to t. So what that means is that we can dispense with conditioning on the event that tau is finite. By making this restriction and then removing it at the end, it's without loss of generality fine to assume that the optional time tau is finite, surely. As such, we know that this process s, which is b shifted by tau minus b tau, is a Brownian motion, and it is independent from f tau plus. Now, as we noted, tau is f tau plus measurable, and the stopped process b t tau, which is just this thing here, b t min tau, is also f t plus measurable. That last one is just because this is manifestly f t min tau plus measurable, as we showed in lecture 56.3, because this is an optional time. And of course, t min tau is less than or equal to tau, and so it follows that f t min tau plus is contained in f tau plus. So since the process s is independent from f tau plus, and these two are f tau plus measurable, it follows that s is independent from both tau and the stopped process b tau. Now note also that by the usual Gaussian symmetries, s being a Brownian motion has the same law as minus s. And so what that says is that we can make the following observation. If I take the triple tau, b tau, s, 
which is a random variable taking values in the reals, path space, and path space. That random variable has the same distribution as tau b tau minus s. By the independence of this from these two, these have the same law as those, of course, they're equal. This has the same law as this, and therefore, this triple has the same law as that. But now I just want to observe the following. If I take s at time t minus tau, of course, t minus tau doesn't always make sense because tau could be bigger than t. So let's take it at time t minus tau plus, which means the maximum of this and zero. Well, that is equal to, by definition, b t minus tau plus plus tau minus b tau. And to see what that really is, let's look in the two cases. If t is less than or equal to tau, then this is zero. And so this is b tau minus b tau, which is just zero. On the other hand, if t is greater than or equal to tau, then this is t minus tau, and so this becomes bt minus b tau. Well, there's another way to write that piecewise definition nicely. That's equal to bt minus b t min tau. And so all we have to observe then is that if I take the stopped process bt tau and add to it s t minus tau plus. Well, that's equal to b t min tau plus b t minus b t min tau, which is just b t. On the other hand, if I take b t min tau and subtract from it s t minus tau plus, that's equal to, well, by definition, b t tilde. Now this is a function of this triple and this is a function of that triple. And so since these have the same law, these have the same law, which shows that this reflected Brownian motion is a Brownian motion. In our final lectures to come next, we're going to use this reflection principle to compute exactly the distribution of several random variables that you might think are impossible to compute, like the hitting time for Brownian motion of any height, and like the distribution of the running maximum of Brownian motion.